Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest installment of the conversation series. And we are very fortunate today to be sitting with someone I have been waiting to interview for a long time, and that is uh, photographer Greg Girard. Greg, how are you today? Morning, very well, thank you. He's uh, he's holding down the the upper reaches of of North America. He's in Canada. I'm in Santa Fe, and we've got a long discussion here uh, to uh, to basically delve into the background of how Greg came to be the photographer he is today. Uh, you're a Canadian born in 1955. Those are kind of the vitals that you would uh, have to get out there. When I see your work, I would describe you, if I if someone pigeonholed me and said, you have to describe Greg Girard in one way, I would say that you are a photographer of palette. You have the most specific, unbelievable palette that you've managed to maintained through decades of work and it to make matters worse it's a palette that i absolutely love so i'm insanely jealous every time i see your work for, regardless of where it's from i think it's immediately identifiable based on the palette would you say that that's a a fair concept i mean outside of the fact that your content composition and everything is top notch i think there's a specific palette there um, I, I've got to say, it's really just uh, 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 something in the material I'm using. You know, it's it's the way the film looks, and um, you know, it, it, each different film has its own characteristics. And back when there was a more of a choice of material, different kinds of film, I, I, I did spend a lot of time getting to know uh, what each one was like and I, of course I had my favorites and you know it, depending on the work you're doing and the situation you're in you're taking that into account at the same time you know how how this is going to look under uh the conditions with this film and you know choosing the film accordingly so i mean it, it, all of that is to say that it's really you know paying attention to the material i guess and what were some of your favorite films in in let's say 30 years ago compared to the favorite films of today well, you know, of course, Kodachrome was around back then, and and uh, it was often a, a go-to choice, except if you needed quick turnaround, if you're working for a magazine or something, and you're based in Asia, where um, most, apart from Tokyo and Australia, there was no Kodak lab, so you'd have to ship your film or mail it to those those labs and wait to get it back, which is like a two, three, four week process. So if you're working for magazines, uh, as I was doing at the time, and that's how I was making my living, uh, you know, you would probably choose a different kind of film. So mostly E6, Ektachrome and, and Fujichrome. Yeah, that was uh, even even pondering the idea of waiting four weeks for something right now, I think is probably uh, confusing to a lot of people who, you know, I think my one of my favorite expressions of the modern era is... Uh, when Homer Simpson got his first microwave and said, what do you mean I have to wait 30 seconds? I want it now. Yeah. And I think, um, and so just briefly, are you still shooting film today or are you shooting a mix? Yeah, kind of a mix. I mean, I, I still do use film uh, a lot for my different projects. Um, but again, depending on the situation, I might I might choose digital for some for some things. Okay, let's back up a little bit. You were born in Canada. And 1955, what was your early upbringing? Are you a middle-class Canadian? Are you, explain to me where, where your family was and uh, how you, you know, sort of where you were in the, in Canadian culture and society. Yeah, I grew up in the suburbs, pretty, totally normal upbringing, but from a fairly early age, wanted to get away and travel. And so did that quite early. When I was 18, I, I took a freighter from San Francisco to Hong Kong and that was 1974, and that was my first wow. trip to that part of the world. And, you know, I liked it and continued going back and ended up spending most of my career in that part of the world. Now, at 18, you're boarding a freighter, which, again, sounds like, you know, the telegram era um, to, to a lot of people. That, to me, I was on a ship for four months when I got out of high school. I absolutely love being on the sea. I love being on ships. Uh, was, was the camera in your hand at 18, or was that not yet a thing for you? Yeah, no, I was already photographing. I started when I was around 16. So by 18, I was already doing it for a couple of years and wanted to photograph in, in that part of the world. So, you know, that was part of the the adventure and the reason for traveling. And, you know, when you're traveling with a camera, you're kind of 
seeing more and paying attention more. So it opened up things a lot. And um, the first year was just traveling in Southeast Asia. Uh, and then I ended up living in Tokyo for a number of years and then uh, Hong Kong after that for a, quite a long stretch. And then after Hong Kong, Shanghai. So uh, about 30 some odd years in, in that part of the world. Yeah, I've got a. We're going to get to Hong, Tokyo, Hong Kong, Shanghai, and then back to Vancouver in a little bit. I'm curious about, and this is based on my own personal experience. My grandfather on my father's side was a very successful, popular newspaper columnist here in America. And being a newspaper columnist didn't didn't make you rich, but he was incredibly well known and popular. You couldn't travel anywhere around in our area without him, everyone stopping him because he had the, wrote this column sort of a beloved column. And he and my father were always at odds. And consequently, my father really did not like journalism or photography at all. He thought at best it was a hobby. And his plan for me was to be an investment banker. And I was like, you know, no, I'm, I'm going to be this photographer. What were your parents, you know, at 16, you pick up a camera. Was it, and then at 18, you're on a freighter to Asia with a camera in hand. Was it viewed as like a hobby? Just, this is a passing fad or did they know what kind of commitment you had? Yeah, I must have signaled all that quite early because even in high school, I was staying downtown in cheap hotels on weekends, you know, for <laughs> walking in the city. So <laughs> it started pretty early. Uh, and, and mercifully, they were, um, you know, supportive in the sense of not really necessarily understanding what I was doing, but at least they didn't stand in the way. And that's a huge thing, I think. Yeah, my father... Uh said, I want you to be an investment banker. And he decided to try this experiment with me, which he put a very small amount of money uh, in a in an account and then said, I'm going to teach you how to invest. So I waited for to get access to that money. And the second I got access to it, I took all of it out and I went to San Antonio Camera Exchange and I bought a Leica M4P and a 28. And he <laughs> he was both simultaneously infuriated, but also knew at that point that this was not a hobby for me. This was something that meant a lot more. And I think he kind of backed off a little bit. But I love the CD hotels downtown on the weekends. Um, that brings back a lot of memories. But I also think, too, it just shows... Um, you know, the, the, the idea, the focus that you had at that age, what level of, and you mentioned this before that you at, from an early age, that life in, in suburbia was maybe not as fulfilling as you were looking for. How restless were you then? And how restless are you now? Yeah, I'm still pretty restless. Uh, I mean, I kind of thought everybody wanted to travel and get away from home. And then it took a long time to realize that not everybody wants to do that. Um, but yeah, I'm still pretty restless. And you know, during COVID was chomping at the bit, of course, to continue projects that were suspended because I couldn't travel. And um, you know, fortunately, everybody around me, family-wise, has been okay. So we've, we've been quite lucky. But um, yeah, I, I think I'm still pretty restless. And just uh, last uh, two months ago was in Japan after it opened up. So I went traveling pretty much that part of the world as soon as I could after after COVID restrictions were lifted. Yeah. Our mutual friend, Stuart, uh, emailed me and said, I ran into Greg on the street and he was just hammering, you know, and I was like, I was like, I, it's a combination of focus and restlessness and drive and all that stuff that without knowing you, all I have to do is look at your work. And I know that you have it. You are cursed like all of us that have that camera thing uh, in them ingrained, that hunt for pictures, it's pretty obvious to me. But that was the purpose behind my question about restlessness, because I think it often gets misconstrued as being something else. But I think it's a creative restlessness that I see. And there's no possible way. I don't think you could have ever, ever, ever captured what you have without sort of having that. So 18, you go to Asia. Cameron Hand, was that before you left for Asia, was there any other, was there a colleague? Was there a legend in photography whose work you had seen? Was there, who were the influences or what was influencing you at that time? You know, at that time, I mean, just to see photography with a capital P, you know, you had to kind of look through kind of hobby magazines basically you know titles like modern photography or popular photography i mean there weren't really galleries showing the work the library had work from decades ago you know from the 30s and 
very early work to see contemporary work you really had to go to these kind of let's call them you know keen amateur magazines prosumer i guess is the word today and um but you know mixed in with the uh, the tech tips and the camera and equipment reviews there'd be portfolios by people like gary winogrand or lee friedlander and 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 other less popular names who didn't kind of enter the canon, you know, who maybe kind of fell off the map a bit, but that was where you would see work. Um, and, you know, that that was the, the kind of the gateway for me to see the first pictures that sort of made you go, you know, this is, I mean, I didn't put it in these words then, but it, this is about a way to look at the world, you know, this is, this is about about seeing seeing the world and 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 kind of pushing back on it you know and um and I think I took it took it to heart pretty early and deeply in the sense of both you know not you know not being able to kind of um do everything I wanted to do at at home and feeling like I you know I wanted to to travel and and see the world and see more and and, and see where it where it where it, it takes me yeah, I think um, I saw when I was in high school, I saw an old life magazine with um, Yankee Papa 13, the Larry Burroughs work from, you know, the door gunner in, in Vietnam. Yeah. And I was just uh, I, it just made me feel in a way I had never felt before. I couldn't quite explain it. And then doing a little research, I found the um, hilltop landing zone photo from Burroughs in color of the African-American GI and the white GI, like ready to embrace each other on a hilltop. They both look wounded. And again, I was just like, I've never felt this way before. And I really want to make other people feel this way. And I figured the best way to do that was through the camera, which is what got me me going. But yeah, we didn't have access to this mass archive online, basically an endless amount of, of work online that we can see today. So you're 18, you get on a freighter to Asia, and was Asia the destination out of a logistics situation because you're based on the West Coast, and Asia was was probably maybe not the, the technically the closest foreign area or, or international area, but it was accessible because tankers are running from the West Coast over to, Was that the reason you chose Asia, or was there something else? Yeah, no, I mean, it was a little bit of a contrarian move, I guess, in the sense that, you know, people my age were all going to Europe. And um, I I mean, I'd seen a photograph in a, a Time Life um, series of books uh, published in the early 70s. And it was a, it was a photograph of Hong Kong Harbor um, by... Um, a photographer who's kind of not really well known anymore, Elliot Elisifan, I think his name is, and um, and that that photograph just had something in it that, you know, made me, again, sort of realize how just framing something can sort of change the whole meaning of a scene, what you leave out, what you put in, um, and it was really it was really just a photograph that made me want to see that part of the world and you know, vancouver has a pretty big chinese community especially today but in those days chinatown was a very active different place and i was photographing around there and was drawn to it and so um you know as soon as i could i i arranged to try to go to hong kong on a ship and and, you know, it was already the dawn of commercial air travel and everyone was flying everywhere. And so to find a, a ship that carried a passenger, a freighter was a little difficult, but they were still running. And, um, you know, I, I wanted to travel across the Pacific by uh, by ship and so arrange that. And, um, yeah, so it was it was really I didn't know anybody who'd been to that part of the world and but I was drawn to it and. Um, yeah, so it was worked for a year, saving money after high school. And then the following year, um, you know, took that ship. And took a ship to Hong Kong. And how long were you in Hong Kong? Um, about a month, you know, after it was an 18 day crossing and, um, yeah, I arrived it and really liked it from the get go and just enjoyed being there. And after about a month or so started traveling to other places in the region. And for 18 days on the ship, how did you pass that time? Mostly reading. Um, 
you know, 18 days when you're 18 years old is probably like about four and a half years today, you know, <laughs> and it really, it was, it really felt like a long time. And, yeah. um, um, you know, 48 hours probably would have been enough. Um, but, um, yeah, I know I read, read a lot and hung out with the crew, um, hearing stories from that part of the world by the, the Filipino sailors on the ship. So I read something about um, sort of your early discovery in photography. And after you'd been doing this for a while, there was something about artificial light on color film that was something that resonated with you. Was that something you had discovered in Vancouver or was that something you discovered once you made your way to Asia? Um, a little bit of both. I mean, I was I started photographing in color right from the get go, um, but wasn't really alert to its possibilities until a few years later, probably when I was living in Tokyo. So that's like late 70s and really started paying attention to what it looked like in on different film stocks, um, different lighting situations, different color temperatures, different light sources. Um, yeah, that's something I started exploring when I was living in, in, in Tokyo in the late 70s. So I want to talk quickly about, or not quickly, I want to talk about total immersion as a photographer. So you get on this ship, you it takes 18 days across, you get to Hong Kong, you spend a month, then you spart, then you head off into other parts of Asia. The reason I'm bringing up this question is when I graduated from photography school in 92, the sort of the barometer in my mind for long-term professional, high-quality documentary work was Sebastio Salgado. And Salgado spent approximately 10 years per project. And he would, I was working for Kodak in the late 90s. Kodak, he, apparently, I was not involved in this, but apparently he went and pitched this, the workers project. And it was a 10 year thing with exhibitions and books. And like they had this, this plot running out for 10, for 10 years. Fast forward 20 years later. I'm at a show in Los Angeles. I was living in California at the time, and I went to a show, and the photographer, I looked at the work, and I was like, wow, this doesn't really seem like how, – how did this person get a show? And on the artist statement on the side, it said – the photographer said, this is the kind of work I love, long-term projects. I took an entire weekend to shoot this work and that's what that's what he got the show from. And I was like, wow, you know, we've there's been such a dramatic shift. When when photography like fully encapsulated you, you're in Asia, you're looking around and you're saying, this is what I'm going to do with the rest of my adult life. How important – it was there any other way to do this work? You can't keep just going back and forth to Vancouver and going back for short periods of time. You had to go all in, right? Yeah. I mean I, I had no idea how to make a living from it, how to get anything published or shown – and I had no idea if that would ever even happen. It was so far beyond anything I knew that uh, I hardly even let it enter my my mind. You know, it just seemed like just so far away. I mean, so all, all I knew I could do was just, you know, making keep making pictures. And I'm, of course, paying attention to the work of other people and how they do it. And it really, it really changed for me when I fell into a job when I was in Hong Kong working for the BBC as a, as a sound recordist. And that's my, that was my really education about what journalism is. So okay. I'm, suddenly I'm part of a television news crew based in Hong Kong, flying into these news situations all over the region. And, you know, little by little, I'm, I'm starting to see how that works. You know, I didn't train as a journalist. I had no journalistic background except by paying attention to photography, that kind of photography. And I don't think I probably would have been able to, uh, you know, understand what went into something like a Larry Burroughs picture uh, from that helicopter or from that hilltop, you know, about all the backstory to get to where you had to be in those situations. But that's what I learned by working with the BBC was that whole backstory logistical part of what's involved in getting into those situations and, you know, what it means to make a, a news picture or a, a news feature kind of picture that's going to be published. So I did that for four years. And while I'm working for the BBC, I'm in many situations 
uh, in, a, in, a, in an event or a story where there's a photographer from Time Magazine or Newsweek or the wire services. And so I'm getting to know these people and I'm paying attention to what they're doing and in a way working alongside of them and then the next week seeing their pictures in Time Magazine or Newsweek. And, you know, that's how I kind of got a, a bit of a knowledge of how that all works. And uh, in the summer of 87, I had a holiday from the BBC and I went to Sri Lanka to photograph the civil war there, kind of using what I'd learned uh, from my time with the BBC and, you know, got onto an army helicopter into the north of the country where the civil war was going on and came back with a really strong set of pictures and published in a local magazine. They offered me a job and that allowed me to kind of transition from television to being a news magazine photographer. And that was a huge jump and a huge opening. And, you know, that was my break, as they say, and that allowed me to start working as a, as a photographer. And that was a, a big step and a big thing. And, um, you know, I, in a way I kind of put aside all those personal photographs that I um, started making as a young person and went in, you know, very hard working as a magazine photographer, which is you know, quite a different thing is from doing your, your own work, let's say. So two things. One, I absolutely love sound recording, which, you know, anybody who's a sound geek, I, I'm, I'm right there with you. I love it. I suck at it, but I, but I love doing it. In fact, right before this interview, I thought I had enough time to get out my little shotgun mic. I was going to do some recording outside, ran out of time. Two, I love the fact that your, your break came from a vacation uh, to a war zone in Sri Lanka. And I think I just want to stress to people listening to this and watching this that that to me is a level of commitment when you get on a plane and you go to a place like that. And I'm not a conflict photographer. I'm not a war zone photographer. Um, I've been shot at a few times in the US, oddly enough. And that was enough for me to go, you know, hey, maybe I'll be a documentary photographer and not a not a conflict photographer. But um, uh, one of the my instructors in college was going into Haiti when it was at the sort of height of the unrest in Haiti. And I was asking him what it was like when he was flying in. And he said um, it was unnerving because the plane was empty. And I was like, "Ooh, that's got to be a long flight, even if it's from, you know, Miami into Port-au-Prince. You're like, wow, I'm, I'm sort of in this solo. How risky was that? situation in Sri Lanka and how easy or difficult did, did you find? I mean, you said you came back with a strong body of images. So how how was that working in that situation for the first time in your life? Well, I'd been in conflict situations working for the BBC. Oh, the BBC. So, that's so, right. Yeah. So I was, uh, I'd been in places where, you know, shots are being fired and the rest of it, but it's a little, it's a little different, uh, when you're working as a independent photographer, you know, you're not part of a team or a crew, um, you know, quite often in, in the start of your career, you're, you're operating by yourself. You, you may have a letter from a magazine introducing you if you need credentials, you may not. I mean, part of the thing working for the BBC was just, you know, the, the useful logistics about um, getting accredited when that's, going to serve you well and maybe weighing it when it's not. I mean, just learning some of these things that you, you, you have to kind of understand and know to kind of operate in these situations. But, you know, I mean, working in battle zones and you, you take your cue from people around you. If you're with somebody, if you're with let's say the army or if you're with the rebels, you kind of take your cue from what's going on with them. And um, yeah, and every every time you do it, you learn something new and get better at it. And so you're sitting, you're shooting film in that situation and you're just basically sitting on that film until you fly back to Hong Kong or Tokyo and get it processed and then off to the mags. Or is it going directly to the magazine or are you having it processed and doing the editing yourself? Yeah, sometimes you're carrying it back with you on the plane to wherever you're going, and sometimes the story is ongoing, and you have to find either someone to carry it or you send an air cargo to London or New York. Um, so, I mean, even in those days, it was difficult trying to get someone to carry a bag of film on a plane. You know, I mean, it. You, let's let, now, but 
let's explain what you're talking about here, because I think most people are going to say that's impossible or there is no way that anybody would do that. But what you're talking about is you're working in a war zone in Sri Lanka. Let's say that you shoot for a week in the field. You go back to Colombo. You go to you have to go to the airport with your bag of film and look for basically a stranger who's boarding a flight to the city that you want your film to arrive in. And you have to approach this stranger and say, hey, you know, my name's Greg Gerard. I'm a photographer. Would you mind taking this to the airport in Hong Kong or, or Tokyo? And people did it. They, they took yeah, film. Yeah, yeah that's did. that's unbelievable. And, and, yeah, and not for money, just kind of being a good a good a good citizen, as it were. You know, help helping news get out about what's going on. Um, and you know, sometimes it would have to transit. Like you're shooting for time in Sri Lanka. There's no flights from Sri-, Sri Lanka to New York. It's got to go through London. So somebody carries it to London and then time sends somebody to the airport to take it from London to New York. And yeah, it's it's a long logistical chain. Unbelievable. Okay, let's jump to your move to Tokyo. What was it about Tokyo at the time that said, okay, I'm gonna, this is where I'm gonna plant roots? Well. Tokyo was the place I'd kind of avoided as a young traveler because even in the in the 1970s it had a reputation for being an expensive place and you know if you're tra- trying to travel for as long as possible in the region you might skip Japan and use your use your 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 money to travel in cheaper places like Southeast Asia you know, Thailand and Indonesia Philippines etc um, so my 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 arrival in Tokyo was on a stop o- stopover on the way to to Hong Kong and Bangkok, and I I thought I'd just you know stay a couple of days, um, stowed my baggage at the airport, um, went into the city looking around, and that first night just really was quite smitten, and decided that first night to try and stay there. So um, you know ended up staying at some youth hostel where I met an American guy who was teaching English and he was going to quit. And, you know, I took over his class after I had no teaching experience. I was like 20 (laughs) years old, you know, what, what do I know? But in those days, the schools were less careful about who they hired. And, um, so suddenly after a week in Tokyo, I was teaching English and found an apartment and was, you know, living living in Tokyo and ended up staying for, for a couple of years doing that. Um, you know, so I was teaching English and allowing, you know, maybe three days a week to photograph and four days a week to, to teach. And that went on for, for a few years. Um, and it wasn't until quite a bit later that I arrived back in Tokyo as a working photographer in the in the late 80s. So, you know, my, my time living in, in Tokyo wasn't as a working photographer. It was as a, a young English teacher. And, you know, I wouldn't wouldn't visit working for quite a few years. But you were still dedicating three days a week to shooting. That's right. Yeah, that's pretty. And I was going to that was a question I had to hear for later, which is the ratio of time spent doing extraneous business things or life things in comparison to what you're talking about. So three days a week, were you at that time? So you're you're an English teacher, you're living in Tokyo, you're not quite yet a working photographer, but are you working on stories? Or are you working on singles? Yeah, I didn't think in terms of journalism or even documentary, really. Um you know, I, I was I was making pictures in the city, um, and you know I loved Tokyo and thought it was just uh, incredible. And I think one of the one of the reasons it hit me so hard was that there that you know, modern Tokyo hadn't really arrived in the West yet. Japan was still like cherry blossoms and you know rice fields, um, and you know, modern Tokyo as a as a a world city hadn't yet reached Western consciousness, unless you were living and working there, you you didn't really know that. So to kind of stumble across it, as it were, was was powerful and pretty transformative for me. I mean, I I wanted to photograph the Tokyo I was living in and sort of you know show the way it was uh, to who I don't know, but I was you know just 
making pictures of, of that kind of thing. And what was your, the reception to a to a photographer like you in 1970s Tokyo? Was it an open door to photograph, or were there plenty of no, you know, what we we just don't know what you're doing? What, you know, what are you doing this for? Um, you know, I mean, Japanese photographers were all over the place. So being a Western one, you know, you fit right in, in in that sense i mean you know i mean if you saw someone carrying a camera in the street you'd notice it you know so okay. it's not like there's it's not like everyone's walking around photographing you know you would notice somebody who's carrying you know a serious camera so that that was that that was how that part of it worked but i mean as a, as a as a westerner photographing in in tokyo you know i mean you don't you don't really you don't really stand out i think any more than any other photographer would and do you still out of curiosity do you still love tokyo i do very much so yeah cuz you just came back right that's where you ran into yeah that's uh i'm glad to hear that i've not yet been to japan it's very high on my list and i and not a week goes by that i don't think about trying to figure out a way to get over there let's move on japan after tokyo you hit hong kong and what era did you live in hong kong so I arrived, I, I traveled there in the 70s, but uh, it was late 82 um, when I kind of arrived on on a, on a visit, not knowing exactly what I was going to do, thinking that I was going to try to stay somewhere in that part of the world. And um, so I arrived in, in Hong Kong in late 82 and did indeed end up staying there. Um, uh, so early 83, fell into a job with the BBC and that kind of kind of anchored me to the place for for a good many years until I started working for a magazine called Asia Week. Oh yeah, and sure. So yeah, and that so that's the magazine that gave me my start. Um so the early to mid 80s working with the BBC and then late 80s starting to work for for Asia Week uh, all over the region and then I I was only on staff with them for a year and then started working freelance for for everybody. And so it went, Hong Kong went back under Chinese rule in 97, correct? And was that something that you revisited in 97 or did you stay away from that story? Uh, no, no, I was, I was living there at the time. So, you know, the, the countdown to 1997 kind of just was what you lived and breathed every day in those years. Um, it was just, it was the, it was the thing that was ticking down in, in, in your life and in Hong Kong's life. So, um, yeah, I was on assignment, you know, many photographers flew in from all over for every magazine to, to kind of cover the, the handover. So everybody was there and Time Magazine probably had 10 photographers working and, um, you know, so it was it was a big story. Um, and then after after the handover in 1998, I, I moved from Hong Kong to Shanghai. Yeah, I want to talk about Shanghai next, because that seems to me like it it. Was it a, a because Shanghai is just a mega city? I've been to Hong Kong a few times. It's not not that it's not a big city or incredibly dense or anything like that. But Shanghai just seems like on a, on a different scale. And why Shanghai? And what was the was there any? Um, I'm assuming when you moved to Shanghai, you're still freelancing, so the client list that you would have had in a place like Hong Kong or Tokyo would have just transferred over to you being in Shanghai. But why did you end up going there? You know, the writing was on the wall through the, the 90s, you know, uh, everything about China. Uh, it was already, a, you know, a big manufacturing hub, but just its place in the world was was expanding. And, you know, living in Hong Kong and traveling to China to photograph, um, you know, it was it was complicated in certain ways. And I just felt to really, you know, cover what was going on in China or experience it even it'd be better to be living there. And so I, um, my, my agency at the time, contact press images, they sponsored me to open a bureau in Shanghai, which was the way to get my journalist visa, um, to be able to operate there as a, as a photographer without having to look over your shoulder, you know, because if you're there on a tourist visa, you're not supposed to be, yeah, making news kind of pictures, you know. So um, to sort all that out, I opened a bureau to get my my journalist 
visa and journalist card and whatnot. Um, it was a, you know, it was a step kind of backwards in terms of modernity, you know, at that time, moving from Hong Kong to Shanghai, I mean, Shanghai wasn't yet integrated with the world in the way it became in the 2000s. But then, you know, you see with China what can happen, they can just turn it off, you know. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's illustrative, as everybody's discovering, of how just how precarious this relationship with China actually is. So um, in any case, so I, I moved everything from Hong Kong to Shanghai and started working and living there. And indeed, as you say, your, your client list moves with you. But when you're in Hong Kong, you're kind of the Asia regional guy. And when you move to Shanghai, you become the China guy, you know. China guy. Um, yeah, you know, it's like there's there's so much going on in China, but the perception is that you're you're just covering that now, you know. So and indeed the logistics of traveling from Shanghai to other places in those days were a little bit more complicated. Um I I you know, by the the late 2000s, you know, China was connected by air routes to every place in the region like any other big city but in a little bit earlier you might have to transit through hong kong to get where you're trying to go so you're kind of in in you're in the china quadrant you know and 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 you're seen as as kind of dedicated to to that story rather than being um, a, a regional person so week after next, if all goes as planned, I will be once again catching up with the international man of mystery, Robert Pledge, who is still involved with Contact, right? I mean, he's still the direct, I don't know what his title is, but director of Contact Press. Yeah. And and Contact, for the, for the viewers, Contact is an agency that does not get the, you know, you, Magnum, I, someone sent me a link this morning about a Bob Dylan song set to images from the Magnum archive. Magnum is something that you hear about all the time. Agencies like Seven, um, Noor, you know, those kind of things. Contact is, to me, one of the most important agencies that ever really existed in the modern era for photojournalism. And the roster of photographers that Contact has is just it, every there, there's no fat on that roster. It's just super solid people. When you became bureau bureau director in Shanghai, were you the lone photographer? Were there other contact people coming in or just other freelancers or were you solo? Yeah, I was very much solo. And, you know, and, and again, I mean, this was the, the, the these were part of the hoops you had to jump through to operate as a journalist in China. You You have to open a bureau to to get your journalist visa and your journalist card so without that there was there's no there's no way to work there except on journalist visas to visit which are hard to come by so yeah. um so contact agreed to furnish with furnish me with the documentation to open the bureau they're not they're not committed to me to pay a salary or anything like that it was okay. just a a way to to for me to be there but i mean the the upside for them is that they have a photographer working in china at the time when china was opening up in a, in, a, in a big way was this still 100% film or had digital started to creep into the process by this point so this, this was 1998 so it was just the very early yeah. early days of of digital um Kodak DCS 520s and 560s were around, but that was that was some of the you know those were kind of the most capable in the 97 98. That's what I was curious about if there was if you were starting to feel any pressure at that point from from magazines and people saying, "Hey, Greg, we love your stuff, but we're going to need you to use this new new technology." Probably not till the early 2000s. Um, people were were shifting over in 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 droves, I guess you could say. So of those three locations, Tokyo, Hong Kong, Shanghai, I say to you, Greg, I got to put it to you right now. You have to tell me of those three, what was the most significant location in terms of impacting your photography? Was it just early learning experience of Tokyo or was it Shanghai? Because by this time you've been more, you're more polished. What, which one of those three do you think was most impactful? In terms of photography, I mean... 
it it's kind of well in terms of making a living it would have to be hong kong is that's what gave me the opportunity to to start making a living as a photographer but you know as it happened more by coincidence than any kind of determination by me i happened to be living through really transformative times for each of those three cities um just as as it played out so you know japan in the 70s and early 80s hong kong in the 80s and 90s and then shanghai in the 90s and 2000s you know the, the these were the kind of pivotal times i think for each of those three places and as it happened i just have happened to kind of surf that wave through each of those places at that time. Um, but, you know, I mean, also the other thing to consider is, you know, at what time of one's life are you in these places, you know, your twenties, your thirties, your forties. And that's, that's also a prism to understand what, what was happening at the time. As well. well, I think I think your timing was impeccable for those regions and those eras, as you mentioned. I think I don't think you could have had a better time in in those places. Um, what year did you go back to Vancouver? So I left Shanghai in two thousand twelve, I guess. Uh, okay. After, yeah. So after about yeah thirteen fourteen years in, in Shanghai. Wow, that is incredible. I mean, I, I'm jealous and so impressed. I can't, um, I mean, it's not easy. I don't think, I don't think that lifestyle, you know, it's, it's a demanding thing. That's not right for a lot of people. And when you tie your, not only just being there as a photographer, but also being in the journalism world in particular, where there's a lot of other stresses and timelines and deadlines. And it's, it's hard. I think it's pretty commendable to say that you had a run like that. Um, it's, it's stunning to me. Uh, I want to jump forward a little bit here because, I want to talk about books because for someone who has had the kind of career that you have, for someone like you to get a single book deal over the course of their entire career is still considered kind of a monumental feat. Getting a book deal is incredibly difficult. It's time-consuming, expensive. It's complicated. It requires a team to put these books out into the world. And somehow you have – and I'm just going to list a, a partial listing here – under Vancouver, 1972 to 82, Kowloon Walled City, Phantom Shanghai, Hanoi Calling, In the Near Distance, Hotel Okinawa, uh, HK Hong Kong PM Hong Kong Nightlife, 1974 to 89. Um, and you're still out hammering in Japan a few weeks ago. How on earth did you manage, number one, to compile the amount of work it takes to create a single book? But I mean, how did this happen? To get so many books because and by the way these are not like uh, trivial books that were done you know one-off things these are beautifully printed published um efforts so how did this how did the idea of books even become a reality for you um well it kind of goes back to the earliest days where you're you know the, the work of the people you like is appearing in books you know and that's... like who give me give me some names well, of course, Robert Frank, you know, the Americans. Um, also, it has to be said, like Japanese photographers living in Tokyo, kind of discovering the world of Japanese photography uh, and just the ubiquitousness of photography in Japan in the 70s, you know, not just in um, photography books, but just advertising and just you're surrounded by the, the visuals in a way that didn't really exist in North America at the time. So, you know, er, in those early days, just, you know, the world of Japanese photography opening up and, you know, books were just such a huge part of what was kind of, you know, hitting me at the time. So, you know, even though, so I start, I was able to start making a living as a photographer for magazines. I, I went at that pretty hard, but that after a number of years, for me kind of played out where you know everything i want to do is not going to fit into this you know i mean i'm i, I want to photograph shanghai in a way that no story no magazine story is going to be able to to accommodate because it's not about those things that magazine stories are about you know right and so 
to, to do that properly, I kind of had to turn my back on magazines in a way. And that's what I did with a, a book called Phantom Shanghai. It was, you know, kind of going back to the earliest days of picture making where you're just responding on a more kind of visceral level to the city and, you know, you're mixing, you know, what you think about it with what you feel about it. And, you know, those things don't necessarily illustrate magazine stories. So, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I just, in, in a way, I pretty consciously turned my back on, on magazines and stopped thinking about that because you know, as a freelance photographer, the more pictures you make that sell the, you know, the, better your 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 bottom line improves and you can kind of fall into a bit of a trap in your kind of pictures you make frankly you know by by thinking that way and so i i i for myself i really needed to, to step away from that and um not knowing exactly where that was going to go i i was thinking i hope to make a a book about that and i made a book about the kowloon walled city with uh my colleague in that project ian lambert and that was a five-year undertaking photographing when I was in Hong Kong. And in Shanghai, I, you know, the demands of the magazines are are quite um, powerful, you know, and you're going to want to make pictures that get into magazines, but that's one kind of picture. And yeah, I, I wanted to make other kinds of pictures. Yeah, I mean, I think what you're referring to is like edit, edit, every magazine has an editorial style. Every newspaper has an editorial style. And if the more you do it, the more you're sort of channeled into that one style of picture that's going to work. But when you're a photographer that has that sees the world in multiple ways, you can see through the magazine filter. But then you see through this per personal filter of long exposure to these Asian cultures, and you're like, I want to go and do this. You mentioned that Kowloon was a five-year project. If you could... Um, average out of all the books that you've done the kind of time frame that re was required for a typical typical book so was it a was five years kind of the setting or were other books done quickly or others take longer you know of course it depends on how much time each month you can spend on it i was at the time i was based in hong kong and traveling in all over the region you know working for different magazines on news stories so i would you know in between these assignments out of hong kong uh, i would be in Hong Kong, and that was my kind of ongoing project. And I, you know, I didn't know it was going to turn into a book. I, I, I thought it was book worthy in terms of subject and um, and also just kind of raw information to kind of set the record straight about what that place was. It was so different than what people actually thought about it, and its its reputation and whatnot. But um, yeah, you know, it depends on how much time you've got to devote to something. Uh, the book on Hanoi was photographed you know, over the course of a year in maybe four very concentrated visits. Um, that was an invitation to do something. So you know, each project's a little bit different in terms of how much time you can devote to it at, at, you know, at what kind of um, in, in, you know, intensity or, or amount of time. And when you when you decided to, in your own words, to turn your back on the editorial world and and start focusing more on these longer term projects, did you change your technique, um, or were you shooting the same cameras, lenses, films, and everything that you did for editorial? Did you just continue that into these projects, or did you depart and go six six or six seven or or change up your your technique? Yeah, I can say that the the change of format played a role that was kind of a signal and switching from 35 mil to six by seven was kind of a signal that this is, this is this other work now, you know, this yeah. is, this is stuff for, for me, you know, where I, I don't have to ever think about this going anywhere else. And that was, you know, it's, it's a kind of a, a conceit or a cheat, but it was a very useful one. Uh, the, the signal that this, this is, this is not for that. This is for this, you know, yeah, I was assuming because when I look at the work now, it looks like six, seven um, film and I, you know, editorial is going to pr primarily be after that 35 millimeter transparency or, you know, sometimes color neg. But I figured when you made that jump that there was probably another, like you said, you, you call it a cheat or it could be an assist of saying, OK, this is for me now. This is a different chapter in my life. Um, when it came to the books, were the books created because you approached publishers or the opposite? Or did they come to you? Um, they came to me. That was, of course, very satisfying. I mean, I... Oh, my uh, God. That's unbelievable. 
Yeah, it doesn't happen very often. I wish it would happen to me more, frankly. You know. Yeah. But, um, no, no, no. You're you've been hogging books long enough, man. Give it. Give the rest of us some chance. <laughs> um, well, I mean, also the whole model has changed in the last years. But um, yeah, I mean, the the first book I I I, I worked on was a collaboration with an architectural photographer and publisher, Ian Lambert. So we were both living in Hong Kong at the time. And um, it turned out we were both photographing in the Kowloon Walled City and didn't realize it. And our styles were very different. And we were introduced through a mutual friend and we decided to pool our resources. And it became um, it became a book and then a, a, a second edition and on it went. But um, for Phantom Shanghai, that was my um, kind of you know personal effort to make these pictures that I, I wanted to see in the city I was living that I wasn't even, that I wasn't seeing. So, you know, and that's, that's probably a little bit true or a lot true with each of my projects. You know, it's just like, I'm, I'm not seeing the pictures I want to see. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to make them myself, you know, and um, I, it turns I, I, out, go ahead. Oh, no, I, I just had a question that dawned on me. And I've never, I, I don't know what the answer to this will be. So I'm, I'm curious your thoughts. You shoot for editorials and editorial publications. You've done this for decades. Then you come to this point where you're like, you know what? I need to, I'm not seeing the pictures I want to see. So I'm going to go out and I'm going to do this other work. And you switch to six, seven, and you all of a sudden you're like rattling off book after book after book. My question is one, why do you think the magazines didn't want this kind of work? And what would the impact have been had the magazines run the kind of work that you were running, that you were creating now? Would there have been a more significant impact? Because frankly, my guess is the work that's in these books is better than the work, even though it's different. I know we're talking about apples and oranges. It's better than what the magazines were running, is my guess. What do you think the impact would be, and why the heck did they not run this stuff? Um, you know, there. You know, vi visual literacy is now more commonplace in magazines than it was then. So. Some pictures are are not illustrative enough of a story that needs to be illustrated, you know. Okay. Fair. So, so they're either too subtle, or they're just not hitting the note that needs to be hit to illustrate the story that needs to be illustrated. So, for example, my pictures of Shanghai were of pictures of very ordinary scenes of the city at night that aren't really about anything except this is Shanghai. But for a magazine to do a picture to, story about Shanghai, so what are they gonna be saying? Really, it's about how much it's changing, you know? So, or or, or whatever, it has to be about something. Um, you know, and even today when mainstream media, let's call it, um, when they do a feature about, let's say a, a book about a city I've done, they might not introduce the book. They they use the pictures to introduce an editorial angle on a city. You know, so there it, again, it just depends on on the needs of the of the publication or the platform. So it, it if I have a book come out, you know, one needs to promote it, and so you send the material around and. If it's a pure photography platform, they can just present it as photography or as art or whatever. But if it's a, a mainstream magazine, it might be useful for them, for their purposes, to present it as, oh, here's a story about, you know, uh, changes in Tokyo in the 1980s, rather than, you know, Greg Gerard's pictures yeah. as a 20 year old walking around Tokyo. Right. You know, so, right. It, you know, it depends on the needs of the platform. So let's talk about during the time that you're making these books, let's talk about a typical day. And I know that's impossible, but we're going to do it anyway. So you're researching the next whatever, the next chapter, the next shoot. You're researching where you want to go, what you want to see. You're getting up early, you're taking public transit, you're going, you're spending a day, two days, hours. What is a typical day like during that era? And what's a typical day like today? Um, 
Well, all right. Let's let's maybe as an example, um, a book I did about Hanoi was an invitation. So that was um, very rare. Um, uh, a, a, a business person in Hanoi had seen the Phantom Shanghai book and and loved that. Uh, this kind of portrait of a city where it had been kind of frozen in time for decades and then mm -hmm. China re-engages with the world and starts going gangbusters and you have these kind of two places occupying the same space the the city that was kind of frozen in time and this new one that's being transposed onto it and in a way the same thing was happening in Shanghai some years later and it was the millennium the 1000th anniversary of Hanoi so I was invited to do a book project and I kind of laid it all out. Well, here's what it's going to cost. And, you know, um, I can deliver this by this point in time. And that was a super fun project, you know, because I was living in Shanghai and I would fly into Hanoi and just work for two or three weeks at a stretch, morning, noon and night. So it's not very often I get to work like that. You know, yeah. usually you're kind of crawling along, you're researching, you're maybe doing other things at the same time. So that was a, a pretty special period. And, and you know, I, I actually think photography is quite an athletic undertaking. You know, you're moving around a lot, you're concentrating. You know, I don't, I don't, I can't do it for eight hours a day. I can do it for a few hours at a stretch, unless you're just doing it without any, a, any real intention and just wandering around. And if you miss something, fine, and come back another day and it doesn't matter. But if you're, let's say really working, it's it's a fairly physical activity and you can only do it for so many hours. So I try to, you know, pick my time carefully. And as, as you indicate, you might go out in the morning. Um, you know, I'm photographing a lot at night or in, in or at dawn, dusk, evening. So I might I might bracket my day that way, you know, photograph morning, have a break, do research, you know, meet people, eat the rest of it go out again late afternoon into the early evening, you know, like four or five hours a day photographing. I think it's, 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 it's quite a lot. Um, yeah. So how many rolls yeah. of, how many rolls of film did you shoot on the Hanoi project? I don't need an exact number. Although if you had yeah, an no, exact I number, I would be impressed. Uh, um, Is it more than two? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Maybe six to 800 rolls. Of of six seven, yeah. Wow, six to eight hundred rolls of six seven. That just hearing that makes me happy. Makes me <laughs> happy. I mean, that's such an amazing, amazing thing to be able, as you mentioned, a typical kind of assignment. You're invited in to do nothing else but create this project, and to have the the time and really the content to burn eight six to eight hundred rolls of film that to me is the exciting part because we as we all know not every story is a home run sometimes you start and stop because you get in and say i can't get the story I, i've worked on a project in the united states for four years it was about what it was like to be muslim and live in america but it was prior to 9 11 and for whatever reason like no one was interested in this story but i worked on it for four years and i'm not muslim and I was also, regard, even though I wasn't working in journalism, I was viewed as a journalist. And so ultimately, my contact came to me and said, look, you're never going to get the A story because you know, you're not Muslim and you're viewed as a journalist. And so I just sort of had to uh, jettison. I learned a lot. I loved it. I met incredible people. I would totally do it again in a minute, but I never did anything with that project because I just couldn't progress any further. So, um, so uh, what, my, my next question was actually something that you just referenced is you look like you're fit. You know, you're a pretty fit guy. And I think one of the things that kind of gets lost in the shuffle is how physically demanding this job is. How do you keep yourself in shape and how do you model your life to allow you to continue to do this kind of work? I I, I don't know. I I have to say I haven't I don't really even think about it. I mean, I, I you know walking around photographing is probably the most exercise I get. Um, <laughs> I mean I, you know, I swim a little, but I mean, th that's more recent, um, you know, more to do with just being kind of stuck here. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I mean, walking around, I mean, you know, this last trip to Japan, I'm carrying quite a lot of gear. 
and you know changing hotels almost every day so you know it's it's a lot of moving around with with stuff um on and off trains and planes and what how long, how long was that trip that was uh about three and a half weeks and how many how much of that was spent shooting almost every well every day you know certainly every day um i was mostly doing things at night um but you know i mean i wander around during the day as well without knowing exactly what i'm doing it doesn't necessarily fit into that project but maybe another one um i mean it, you know when you're working on something i've never liked the idea of not shooting something because it doesn't fit in with some project or story you're working on now right you know you just the fun of it is just to see things and, and keep doing things that that strike you and um, you know, that was always, that was always part of the problem of, of shooting a magazine story in these different places is having to conserve film for your story and not really wasting it on things that didn't fit in the story, so to speak. And, um, sure. you know, I mean, I always, I mean, I'm, perhaps that's one great thing about digital is that that's less of a concern. But um, yeah, I've always kind of thought, well, this doesn't fit in with that, but it's it's still there, you know. And what, was was the Japan trip this recent one digital or film? Mostly film, but a little little digital as well. And with your film camera, what's your primary, the most used uh, focal length that you're working with? Um, well, or I'm lens. Using, uh, the eighty on a Mamiya Seven. So and that's, so. So the 80 is a 50, in essence, on a 35. More like a 40, actually. So a okay, 40. That's a great, great sweet spot. So how does that lens, that focal length, because um, I use a Hasselblad, and with an 80, that's sort of the prime lens on the Hasselblad. How does that focal length uh, impact how you approach a scene? And when you approach a scene, what are you? what's the primary thing are you looking for? Light, timing, composition? How does that work and how does the 80 and you know affect that and why is that your primary focal length? Um well I guess it's just um like the, you know it's interesting I mean th these kind of questions are, are I think are actually interesting but I mean, it, it's it's pretty subjective at the same time right so you know shooting with a 28 for example in the magazine world uh, of its time was was a kind of a magazine-y look, you know. Right. It, it's it's kind of pretty close to human perspective if you're up close. Um, it doesn't read as a, as a lensy look, but a couple inches or feet back, it can start to look very lensy and wide, you know. But right. as you say, there's these sweet spots where things look right, and um, I guess that's you know I guess that's what you're going after is for things to look right, you know, to, to you, whatever that is. And, um, you know, you can want it to look like a wide angle lens, or you can want it to look sort of, you know, not to have so much of a lensy look. So I tend to not want to see the lens in the picture, you know, okay. I just want to yep. see, I want to see the scene and that whatever, whatever delivers that. I mean, you could be using a super long lens or a super wide lens, but it just, it's what delivers what you want. Um, and that, that's the way I'll describe it because I think, you know, there are these lensy looks and they can look great, you know, stylistically for sure. whatever you're trying to do. Um, and I've certainly gone that route in the past, you know, using a 300 because it looks kind of really super interesting or using a 20 because it looks kind of super interesting, yeah. you know, but, but, but then, you know, then there's this other thing where you just want the scene itself to speak or the room. You don't want to see you on the lens and all these other choices, you know, whatever brings out the thing you're trying to bring out. Yeah. So when I worked in the newspaper or I, I got an internship out of school and worked in newspapers for a few years, and there was sort of the 24 millimeter, 300, two, eight photographer who had literally the 24 around their neck and a 300, two, eight over their shoulder. And there was nothing in between. And I think those are exactly what you describe as the lensy look where you're like, oh, and they're, and they're a very quick read because it is so lensy. Yeah. But, and I, myself, <clears throat> I had the 24 
and I had all the same sort of lenses. I never could afford a 300 to eight, but I had the rest of it. But, um, at one point I somehow ended up with a 50 millimeter and I hated it. I, I couldn't figure out how to use it. So I sold it, but something in the back of my head haunted me about that lens. So I bought another one and I hated it and I sold it. And it wasn't until I got it the third time. And it was a combination of that lens on a particular kind of camera, which was a Leica rangefinder where I got a 50 millimeter lens and it just immediately just cemented itself as my, the only lens. If, if you, if you forced me to choose a lens forever, that would be the only lens I would use, whether it's on my Fuji camera or my Leica or what, or my Hasselblad. It's, it's just, and I, I've never heard anyone describe it in quite the way you did, where it's like, you're just allowing the scene to reveal itself and not being a, a lensy on top of it. And so if you're on the streets in Japan and something is happening, is, is there a way for you to define the first thing that you're looking for? Is it, um, you know, is it the light? Are you making sure that you're working in the best light or is it just the composition that's unfolding in front of you? Well, I think this is, these are the, this is why it's so subjective, personal and endless is these things that appeal to everybody are going to be different. And it's just, it's you're signaling to other people to kind of look what you noticed, you know, it can yeah. be the light, it can be, a scarf it can be the way a woman has her hair tied it can you know a gesture um and then and then you know you can see the light and just stop there and wait for someone to walk into it i mean there's so many ways to do it and it's going to be a little bit different for everybody but you know it's just this endless kind of portal you know um yeah. when, and it, once yeah, you start it, noticing it, it is, and it's never something you're ever going to get in front of or catch up to. There's the world's just constantly unfolding. The the last question I have for you, because we've been going now for about an hour and ten. Um, the last question is, what's the end game for you at this point? You're back in Vancouver. You're still traveling out in the field doing things. Is there an ultimate goal that you have that you haven't realized yet, or are you you just enjoying your time going into the world making pictures? That pretty much describes it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I can top that. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, that's a that's a great place to be. Are you still doing assignments, or is it primarily personal work? Yeah, no, I haven't had an assignment for quite a long time now. I mean, um, I it was it's I used to do I can say a fair bit of work for National Geographic. Um, that was true even after I moved back here for a number of years, but um, haven't done anything for them for maybe five or six years. So. Um, it's unlikely I'll, I mean, even though I, as I, it, it's not going to help me by saying I turn my back on magazines to hear from National Geographic, but, <laughs> um, but you never know. Um, some, some yeah. editors will, will, will understand that. Um, um, but no, I mean, for, fortunately, I mean, I, you know, I, I like doing these longer term pro projects. I, I'm represented by a couple of galleries. Um, there's always, there's always something to kind of work on and, finish, do, start anew. So, yeah. Where not, not where can not. people find you online? Um, well, I guess on Instagram, I'm at Greg for a day. That's a good way to see what I do. And, you know, I'm posting stuff from the archive as well as things I'm working on now. Um, a lot of archive stuff gets posted there. Um that's probably the best place to see fresh stuff. Um, and um, my that'll that'll take you to my books, which are at um, greggerardpictures.com. Um, yeah, the books, so, the books are what everybody should go to that uh, that book list. It is quite impressive. Yeah, well, I appreciate you taking the time to uh, to talk with me. I hope at some point I normally get up to Canada in the Victoria area, like once a year, sometimes twice a year, I would love to come to Vancouver and, um, you know, buy you a, a coffee or a drink or whatever. And, uh, I really appreciate you taking, taking time to do this. You're somebody that I wanted to talk to for a long time, whose work I've been seeing for a long time. And, uh, I'm so impressed by, um, by what you've done, what you've created. Well, thanks for the invitation. It was it was fun talking and um, I really appreciate the interest. Thank you. Absolutely.